put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Pompeii 3D Movie Review. Okay, Paul W. Sanderson, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch this one to you. Lower class guy who's likable meets upper class woman who is not that happy with being upper class. She feels a lot for the lower class. She's about to marry this guy who is just reprehensible and she can't stand him either. But then the two of them meet. Unfortunately, in the middle of all of this, there is disaster brewing out in the... Di that's... that's Titanic. Okay, there's gotta be some other big historical... Pompeii. Pompeii... Yeah, okay, so so the, the lower class guy, he's like he's like a gladiator slave guy, and and the the upper class woman is supposed to marry like a senator or or yeah, yeah, and he's responsible for something bad because like that will Yeah, that'll that'll connect to the, the gladiator slave guy. Okay, so the the disaster what was that that was Mount Vesuvius. So okay, there should be a volcano, but everything I've already mentioned really makes for you know a good almost hundred million movies. I, I don't know. I guess maybe sort of fit in volcano in there right at at the end a little bit. I mean, as when my movies break hundred minutes people start going full stigmata in the aisles, and it's a bitch to clean up. Okay, seriously though, the... <laughs> this movie... Paul W. S. Anderson continues to astound me. I am fascinated. It's, it's the, the, the gawking at, at the, the train wreck kind of thing, you know. It just... just have to see how he keeps me... I don't know how he keeps drawing crowds. Maybe they're all me. Maybe they're all you know, people who just like, is this guy for real? Is he trolling us? Because he's got to be trolling us. He can't possibly mean this seriously. Okay, okay, so the, the, the movie opens in, in like 63 AD, you know, and when, when I did research, I came across that, the, you know, in 63 AD, they have the, you know, in Pompeii, there was a, an earthquake, which if I recall, did some damage and they had to rebuild after that. So when the movie starts in 63 AD, you're like, oh, they're going to show the earthquake to like set up. No, they never do. They're, they mention it later on, but then there's no other. No, what it actually is, is that we're seeing the the massacre of, of the, pe the people of... of Jon Snow. I'm just going to go with that because that's how people know him. I don't watch Game of Thrones. I know I'm, I'm the one who doesn't. I, I did a little bit of research on, on this character and, and yeah, that's... He's, he's known for that. So, so anyway, Jon Snow's family is getting massacred. He happens to survive. I'm not going to give away exactly how, but it does basically make sense. You know, and... Basically, pretty much right after that, he, he's like, he gets captured, you know, he's, he's a slave. Okay, it goes 17 years in the, no, no, I said that right, 17 years, which actually places this movie, the, the main events of this movie in 80 AD, not 79 AD. Where I, it sounds like a minor detail maybe, but it's just, that's, that's kind of what, that's one of the big things people do know about this, you know, it's not just, it was 79 AD that the big, anyway, 
So yeah, 17 years, so, so, you know, first he was a kid, now he's, you know, a young man. So basically, this entire bit, that, that could have been done by flashback. We didn't need to start the movie in 63 AD, and we barely spend any time in 63 AD. Okay, 17 years past, we're in Pompeii, right? Wrong! We're in L London, Londinium, or something like that, which, that probably was what London was called back then, or something like that. Anyway, okay, so, we meet Jon Snow as, as an adult, and, you know, he goes in to have this big fight against other gladiators. Scene lasts maybe two minutes, and then he goes to Pompeii. And again, this scene did not did not need to be in the movie. It certainly didn't need to be not a flashback. It's just Paul does not know movie making. I don't know how he keeps getting to make movies, but he just he has no idea what he's doing. And a part of that is, of course, that he keeps stealing elements from much better movies. And in this one, you've got the entire Titanic thing going on, which is basically the whole emotional anger of the film is that of Titanic. And I don't know if this went, went over Paul's head, but Titanic was actually a pretty well-known movie. So people are going to notice that he, that he took Paul, and, and that movie was actually good. This movie is not. So, so, yeah, it's, I, I suppose we should be, you know, somewhat relieved that he finally moved on from, from Aliens, which, you know, of course, I mean, now he also seems to be getting into gladiator territory. He just cannot leave Ridley Scott's movies alone. But in addition to that, and, and of course we have, I mean, whenever you talk about, like, plagiarism or ripoff or the kind of thing, obviously... People are going to be using similar ideas and telling similar stories. The important thing is, does the the retelling of story or a similar, you know, a different take on a similar tale, does it bring anything new to the table? If so, it is worthy. If not, it is a Paul W. Anderson movie. He, he has no idea what to do with these things, so he just smacks them in there and hopes that the fact that they worked well in the original movie will mean that they work well here. This movie steals from 300 too. It, you know that, that big effective image of, of the tree of all the, the, the dead people? They, they, they rip off that. Not only do they rip off that, they use it again in a flashback just to remind you that they ripped off that. And it, it, it's much less effective. They, they even have the, the, when, when the, the whole Thermopylae battle begins, there's this thing with shields up and, you know, a, a co collision between the, the enemy and the, the, the good guys, the, the swords, shields of the good guys. They have that here too, but there's no, there's no proper setup for it. It just... It just happens. Maybe, maybe it's, it's you know Paul's attempt to you know slip it by the audience by not having any build up to it. Anyway, they also do have one character who yells out, "This is madness!" and nobody does answer. This is Pompeii, so you're just gonna have to you know shout that at the screen when it happens, which I fully invite you to do. I think other people were in this movie expecting to enjoy it, I think they, they laughed at it. As, I heard them laugh. I'm pretty sure they thought it was as preposterous as I did. So, to go back to that, that opening. So, it is 80 AD. Jon Snow is on his way to Pompeii, and along the way, also on the way to Pompeii, is... Emily Browning, Cassia, who basically, yeah, it's, it's she and I think the other girl is her sister, but it's maybe like mentioned once and late in the film, but I, I guess that's what she's supposed to, actually, 
That's, yeah, I think that's actually intentional on, on Paul's part that we're not quite supposed to know. Anyway, yeah, maybe they're sisters, maybe the, the saying that it was just, maybe that was actually just a fake out kind of thing. Anyway, the two are, are you know, moving together. Emily and her friend, the cleavage. That's not me being a male chauvinist pig. That's me pointing out that the cameraman of this is a male chauvinist pig. You know her cleavage from the trailer. There are, there are two shots of her, and both are of her cleavage, which, yeah, that's that's why she's in the movie, to, to be, be gawked at. Anyway, the, the, they're in, they're in a, a you know, horse-drawn carriage, passing by Jon Snow and, and the other gladiator slaves. The, like, they, they hit, like, a bump in the road. Horse, you know, the wheel gets, gets stuck, horse collapses, and Jon Snow's like, I know what to do, just cut me loose, cut me loose, man. And... Uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm giving way more emotion than he, he, he barely has an emotion for, for the duration of this, which, yeah. I think he's better in, in Game of Thrones, I, I don't know, it's, again, haven't watched it, but I would imagine it would be, anyway, so yeah, eventually, you know, she, she convinces the, the guy to, you know, unlock, and, and, she goes with him, and and he's like, you know, and and the the horse has fallen over and it's lying there. It's it's clearly in pain, and he points this out as well. And he goes up, and and she, you know, he tells her to to like do some, yeah, yeah, like put put your hand on its chest. That that way, it won't feel me, you know, raising it. Something like that, you know. And, and he lifts its head gently, and he snaps its neck, and it's like, I think Paul is expecting us to be like, oh man, did that really happen? Everybody in the world knows what, what happens when a horse falls over and it's in pain. You snap horses' necks, don't you? And the, the beautiful thing is, this is how the romance starts. This is literally, this is the, this is how they meet, and how the whole, and after that, it's supposed to be this thing of, oh, he's a horse whisperer, and he is, of course, she's, she's right in, in reading in him that he's a horse whisperer, but you, you wouldn't think that from that scene, so when, when she's like, you know, the, when, when she keeps thinking about him, that it's like, she must really get, you know, get her jollies from, from horse murder, but, yeah, or horse mercy kill, to be fair. And, and like, the next time someone invites him to, please, you have to help us with these horses, it's like, oh, more horses for you to kill, you know, just, just yeah. <laughs> so, with, with the... With the basic idea, I've, I've already mentioned that, that there's just barely a volcano in this movie, which, you know, it's, it's an interesting tactic. It's not a new one for Paul, but yeah, we, that's what we're there to see, you know, so, so of course there isn't very much of it. And basically the rest of it is a gladiator story. It, not so much gladiator the movie as maybe Spartacus, something like that. And from that, you would maybe expect to see some, you know, nice gladiatorial battles. And there really aren't that many. Like, there is some action in this, and it's not awful, but it's also just not that compelling. And you're not going to leave this movie with, with, like, a mass of, you know impressions that are really gonna like I mean there are a few images I mean the man knows composition that's that's one of the few things he does know when when it comes to movie making I, I have not you know assaulted him with with a game of trivial pursuit or anything but 
Yeah, though those are mostly it's it's mostly when you're seeing the volcano and it's it's erupting, which apparently, according to Paul, looks a lot like fireworks. So, which to be fair, maybe it does, but but yeah, that's very much the the impression that you get from. But yeah, there are some there are some shots from above the the volcano with like you know ash clouds moving towards the camera and stuff, and the three D. That works very well, you know. Th those are the the images that will stick with you. But none of the action scenes, none of no big character moments, you know, none. Yeah, it's, it's and it's again. Paul likes to do things that most other directors don't. And what he still hasn't quite understood is that. There's a reason most directors don't, and it's because they know better. It's because it doesn't work. He likes to have these little... You know, like, like I said, there are no big character moments. Each time you think there's going to be a big character moment, it, it kind of just fizzles out, or nothing actually happens, or they're prevented from their big character moments, something like that. And he thinks he's subverting the big Hollywood cliches with this, but really, he's just carving out a niche for his own, you know, his own cliches. And they're even worse, because at least the Hollywood cliches, you know, you, you wipe the popcorn, popcorn off your lap, you maybe dry your, your eyes, and, and you go home and you, you, you're, you realize you had a good time at the movies. And that's just not what happens with Paul's movies. Instead, it's more like a... What? So, so... Yeah, we, we have these... Either there's, there's too little build-up and then a climax. Which, you know, I already mentioned that there, you have a scene that's very much like the Thermopylae battle thing. Or you have a lot of build-up to nothing really happening. There are several action bits like that in in this. When you think you might be getting some gladiator fights, you know, gladiator on gladiator battle in this, just don't get your hopes too much up. Is all I'm gonna say. Now and and you you have where he'll you know make a big deal out of a battle between you know. Someone who's like maybe a you know well trained guard and you know one of our main characters or something, and then later some other character will fight like several of these well trained guards and take them out with ease. You know, it's you the the disaster stuff is very clearly guided by the the screenwriter's pen. You know, it's literally. It, it hits exactly who it should, and no one else. And it's also, I mean, true there is not that much of a volcano in this movie, but just also other disaster movies, those do tend to deliver much more on, like, you know, yeah, stuff that, you know, images that you really, t it, especially in usually with characters. That's that's what I'm saying. The, the nice nice compositions in this movie don't involve characters. The the most compelling shots in this thing are the ones where there is no sign of anything living there. That that really tells you something. And yeah, it, it just it doesn't have a lot of these big, really impactful kind of disastery things. Now, I did already mention that the 3D, that is one thing that Paul does well. And this is, I mean, I have not, I did not watch Retribution, Resident Evil Retribution in theaters, but he filmed this Resident Evil Afterlife and The Three Musketeers, all of which I've seen, in 3D, with 3D cameras, and it works out well. It really does there's, there's a real depth to it, and when he does these big, you know, close-ups and, and really 
stunning e images of the, you know, the leading lady, and in the other two mentioned it was Mila Jovovich, who always looks amazing, and in this is Emily Browning, it's really hard to not find yourself, you know, really falling for her. And the, the, there are a lot of nice little touches, there's a lot of, like, ash particles close to, to the viewer and, and things like this. I expected more stuff thrust at the screen, it, that really kind of gimmicky. It does not do that too much, and really instead it is just, you feel like you're close to it. It doesn't, you know, it's not distracting too much. Again, for how little of the volcano you actually get, and for how much, you know, there isn't that much of this where our heroes are really that much in, in danger kind of thing. And of course we also have the, the really odd pacing where, like, literally once the climax starts, there's pretty much constant action. Like, it's not as bad as he has been about it in, you know, in other films, but yeah, it's not good either. And it also, it just takes a lot of the air and fun out of the action scenes when there's so much so close to. Now, the... I, I will leave the, the pulp that was the, the dead horse of my common complaints about Paul, f for now. Now, this is one case where Paul could not actually choose between whether he wanted to do this big gladiator film or a, yeah, a, a disaster film. So rather than actually make this choice, he simply combined them because he still does not realize that the term is kill your darlings, not kill the fond memories of the audience. To be fair, he he is nowhere near as bad as U Bol. I think it's actually U Bol, but yeah, is. I have only watched one movie by that man, and I vowed to myself never again. Anyway, yeah, as as you can maybe tell, Gladiator and Volcano, the, the, these two elements of of. You know, these, these two different stories, you might say, do not really go together well. You know, on... I mean, by themselves, gladiator movies can be great. Volcano movies can be dumb, loud, fun. But, yeah, put, a, put them together, it doesn't really work out so, so well. And, you know, that's also, I mean, this is supposed to be this big Hollywood blockbuster, and it, it certainly has the dumb, but it doesn't really have the fun all that much. Most of the enjoyment is from just how incompetently done it is, and it clearly, I mean, there's money behind it, and I don't know how, but he keeps attracting names, you know, Trinity is in this. You know, you've got Moriarty. It's also, it's hilarious because no one knows quite what accent to do, so they just speak naturally. So Trinity sounds like Trinity. You know, Moriarty has that effeminate British thing going on. And Jack Bauer. Someone told that man that someone in the audience knew when and how the, the volcano would go off and he put on an accent that would torture every one of us until we eventually gave in. You know, you can, you can practically see the, the, you know, the little digital counter up in the corner when, when he first comes on. I can't quite place his accent. I think it's a little, little touch of the Irish. When he's, he introduces himself by his full name several times. It's like, you know, Something Gaius Corvus, and yeah, it has that little bit, the the little, 
you know, at the end of the words, it has a little bit, it's just, I just want the poor guy to find his lucky charms. It's just, it's, it's, it's impossible to take the man seriously. And also, I do want to note that the fact that his last name is Corvus, I'm pretty sure one of his, you know, descendants is actually going to be the crow. But anyway, these, these, Various characters also don't really have a lot to do. They're they're just kind of there. Like if if Cassius' parents were not in the movie, you wouldn't really majorly miss them. Now the you of course can't expect too much of the you know. Too much accuracy here, which, as far as I can tell, it's mostly the eruption itself, other than some of the visuals, the eruption itself has some, you know, has some inaccuracies, where the, the overall, like, you know, architecture of the city and basic layout, you know, Mount Vesuvius compared to Pompeii and the yeah, th things like this, excuse me, are actually fairly accurate, which is impressive for, you know, the guy who thought that what the Three Musketeers needed was a flying gunship. Now, the... One would expect, of course, an overuse of slow-mo, and even some fast-mo. That does not really happen. Uh, at no point does this get slow-mo crazy. In fact, I basically say that every time this goes slow-mo, it's a good time to go slow-mo. It also doesn't overuse wire work, and certainly isn't as obvious as the wire work. I think it's especially in Afterlife that it's, it's absolutely preposterous, especially in that opening scene. Now, the... that more or less covers his... Yeah, and, and I've already hinted some at that there's some video game type, you know, logic going on that, you know, things kind of need to go this way, so we'll just make... Like, in a video game, it, it'll often have to be kind of a linear story where the protagonist, the player character, has to be very active. So, something might happen close to the protagonist where it wouldn't necessarily in a movie, it wouldn't in a different medium where you can, you know, go to... Yeah, where, where it isn't so dependent on the player's involvement in the plot. And, yeah, Paul doesn't think that should only be for video games, he likes to employ it in his movies. And, yeah, that is also true some here. And we have a glorious, just abandonment of logic, especially in the the yeah at 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 the climax. Now, the and this also this does not have any hidden traps or like really claustrophobic hallways, there's, yeah, it, it doesn't really go for, for any of those, of, of Paul's, yeah. Now, the, I, I had heard that the dialogues, this was really bad, I, I thought it was just decent, like, it wasn't ever good, and there are no like quotable lines or something, although the movie certainly does think that it presents some, but yeah, they're not like absolutely horrendous either. Now, there is a... There, there is this hint of that, you know, maybe... Yeah, ba basically it's the, the 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 African slave 
Gladiator, who's like, he's, he's the veteran slave, Atticus, played by Echo, 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 and he has this, you know, he's convinced that if he wins one more fight, he will earn his freedom, because he's been fighting for so long, and, you know, they have a little bit of a, you know, he and, I suppose I should, his name, Jon Snow's character in this is Milo. He and Milo have some discussions about whether that will actually happen. And that's actually... I mean, the, the, basically this movie is supposed to have the this, you know, big love triangle. I don't know that that really works, but there certainly is some romance going on. Especially between Milo and Atticus. Like, they keep having this, you know, back and forth romance where just you wait, I'm gonna kill you, no, I'm gonna kill you, oh, you... And, like, the, the... <laughs> they're, they're... For a little while, there actually appears to be something between Cassia and, and you know, the, the, the walking cleavage. Yeah, it's... And the... This is also, this is in part a revenge story, and yeah, it, it, Paul doesn't really, yeah, it, it doesn't go the way you might think and hope it, it will. Now, the, at, at one point, some, someone comments to Cassia that that slave looks upon you as if you were in a dream, which I I can see what she means. He definitely does look like he's asleep. I actually apparently he like trained himself like insane, and he is ripped. You know, just put himself through ridiculous regimen, and you know, at at the end collapsed. And when he woke up, he had apparently signed on for this movie. And then, again, he kept training, and at the end of each day, he'd collapse, and then he'd wake up, and the cameras were rolling. And he didn't really fully register what was going on before they, you know, cut print. So, at least that's how I would best explain his... <laughs> interestingly understated performance in, in this. Now, the... This... The, this is less nonsensical in, in basic plot and such than the, you know, other recent outings by Paul, which to be fair, is not hard to do, and it's almost impossible to... I mean, you, you gotta give the guy a break every now and then. He can't keep up that level of just complete nonsense. I mean... <laughs> Resident Evil Retribution was particularly just... Nothing goes on in that movie. Just, it's it's one action scene after another with not even a, a thin plot to tie them together. But I can imagine that part of this is also because this was written by, get this, the, the duo who was part of the writing team for Batman Forever. Now, I, I looked really hard. I couldn't really see any stuff in this that was like, oh, that's clearly from Batman Forever. I mean, no, you know, supposed teenager, but actually like 24, 25, 30-ish guy, you know, did Kung Fu with, with any wet laundry. Although, to, to be fair, I think that script was more Akiva Goldsman than, than any, which, yeah, that guy. Yeah. Now, the... So yeah, I suppose 
I mean, the basic filming and editing is fine. The, the action scenes, in theory, are decent, but I guess part of it is that we're not emotionally invested, and also just, yeah, like, like I mentioned before, you know, it's either too little build-up to something big happening, or a lot of build-up to nothing happening, so yeah, just, we aren't really that engaged in the action scenes, and really it's too bad, because, I don't know, there's at least one decent enough action scene in here, and not absolutely everything is, you know, ripped off from, you know, other much, much better movies. But, but yeah, it's just, we're not quite there. It actually, maybe part of it is that the... Yeah, it's just, I can't really give away, but, but one of the big action scenes isn't really between, like, you know, it involves some of our protagonists, but they're not fighting someone who you're really like, yeah, take those guys down, about, you know, so, yeah, and the... Yeah, I suppose that's about what I could say about that, without spoiling. Now, the... I think that more or less covers it. So yeah, the pacing, filming, editing, action, 3D... The acting is... Fine, fine or above, about it's it's average basically. Like no one gives a standout performance in this. And, you know, I mean, as usual. Yeah, Paul doesn't know what to do with with the 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 talent at at his hands. So yeah, they don't really get. To, I mean. I like Kiefer Sutherland. I, I haven't really seen him in too much recent, but that's not really a... Like, I, I think the most recent thing I actually I, I saw where, where he acted was the Phone Booth. But, I mean, he kicks ass in that movie. It's just his voice. But, yeah, the, the guy can act, and the guy can really hold your attention. And it's just... it's. In, in this, you, all you can do is, is laugh. It's really just, yeah. And I'd, I'd say Browning definitely tries. And I'd say also, she's maybe the one who tries the most of her and, and Jon Snow to, to make any kind of appearance of an actual, you know, love or or this kind of thing. I mean we're we're told that they're so in love that it's like you know magic and it's like you know the end of the world kind of thing we don't see that like it's probably good that they tell us that, that we're, that's what we're supposed to be seeing when we look at them because that's not what we see when we look at them and also just the I mean even if we were to take that I mean some of the things that some of the things that people do in this movie just make no sense. And again, it's like Paul wants to say, ah, I bet you didn't see that coming. And we're like, no, we didn't see that coming because what are we even looking at? Who is doing, what? What is, what is happening? What am I, where am I? And yeah, just the, the, yeah, at, at no point do you believe for a second that they really, want to be together. There isn't... yeah. Now, the... But, but yeah, I mean, she, she makes an effort, and I would say she gets away from this more, you know, looking better than, you know, something like Sucker Punch. Now, I suppose that basically 
conversation. So, so yeah, at the end of the day, it's just, it's not all that entertaining other than to just pick apart how just, how consistently it misses the beat. Like, it's, it's always at least a little out of step from what 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 would be good to do and it actually I mean this is only th there are good things to this movie it does have really nice production values I mean you believe that you're seeing Pompeii you believe that you know I mean it feels like they took a camera into this time period into the setting it doesn't feel like I mean if I recall the in the in the Three Musketeers, some of the the period piece stuff, you know, it went nowhere. It or sorry, wires got crossed. It looked ridiculous and didn't really fit the the. the yeah, it it was like a a parody of what they you know would have worn back then. But here it does. Yeah, production values are quite nice, and it does have some nice visuals. And definitely, if you're going to subject yourself to this, I have no idea why you want to do this, but definitely go for a 3D showing because it really does pay off. Now, the th this is also though the kind of movie where I really get to appreciate just how well done the the extra sort of immersion effects in Noah were because the I mean the use of sound in that movie compared to this makes you know that movie sound like just you know amazing surround sound where this is maybe like you know a little box made of cardboard for for transmitting yeah it's just I mean, it sounds fine, but it has nothing on on something like that. Now, I suppose that pretty well. Yeah, basically, you're not really gonna have that much of an impression after leaving. I mean, if you just want to go and watch a big, dumb, loud, fun Hollywood movie, you know, I can completely understand why, and it's just go. Cool. Don't go to this one, it is all. I, I'm not sure what I can really recommend. I haven't watched a ton of the one, I mean, other than... Yeah, no, I definitely go with that one. And then, you know, the, the various, you know, comic book movies. I mean, obviously, Winter Soldier, if... Yeah, if, if you have eyes, watch the Winter Soldier. And Spider-Man, I'd also say, don't go watch this movie. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.